everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Renee. Hope you're all doing really well. If you're new here, welcome. It's great to have you. If you're not, welcome also. It's really nice to have you here again. Uh, I haven't done a reading wrap up in a while. I'm really bad at these. Something you'll learn about me. So yeah, we've got October, November books that I've read. I'm going to try and go through these relatively quickly. A lot of these that I read in October I did a reading vlog on. So if you want to hear more kind of thoughts as I'm reading these books, you should go watch that. Uh, if not, just watch this video. Uh -huh. Starting off with The Argonauts by Maggie Nelson. Uh, in that reading vlog, I talked about how much I struggled with this book, how it kind of challenged me in a lot of ways. I still stand by that. That experience hasn't changed, but I think now that I've had a bit of time to contemplate the book and just sit with it, I realised that I actually really did enjoy this book. I think that the challenging, thought-provoking things that it did for me made me love it even more and that I had kind of worked this up in my head to be this very uh, out of reach novel, not novel, uh, memoir for me. Uh, but this is a memoir about Megan Nelson and her partner Harry and both of their kind of, uh, these moments in their lives where they are both undergoing physical changes, uh, Maggie Nelson is becoming a mother for the first time and her partner Harry is uh, taking testosterone and having um, top surgeries to transition into a man but is still this very gender fluid person, an artist. Um, there's a lot of references in here to uh, thinkers and philosophers and maybe that's the stuff that kind of bogged me down and got me thinking this is not for me but at the core of this story it's about uh people and the idea that the physical kind of outer uh can change throughout life and yet the person at the core of it still remains the same and Maggie Nelson uses this uh story of the Argos, which is a ship that, as it was traveling across the seas, was constantly being worked on, the exterior was being replaced, and by the end of it, it did not look the same. But at the core of it, it was still this boat, it was still the Argos, Here's, hence the, the title of this uh, memoir. And yeah, that's just a really beautiful kind of, an example of what, what she's saying in this book, and what ideas she was putting across and that's something that has definitely kept cropping up for me so I look forward to one day rereading this book and seeing what I get out of it next perhaps seeing how I might have changed as a reader and yeah I'm on the I'm on the Maggie Nelson train so I look forward to reading more of her and not being so scared uh, next I've read Nostalgia Has Ruined My Life by Zara Butcher McGonagall. This is a funny, very fragmentary uh, collection of almost like diary entries written from a narrator who's a young 20-something woman who is living this very kind of listless life. She's looking for a sense of purpose. She has this exterior pressure from the outside world. She feels as though she should be doing more with her life, but she has these barriers that are kind of stopping her, uh, her kind of mental health, her physical health. She's disabled, and so there is that thing that is stopping her physically that people throughout her life are kind of constantly ignoring. And the character has this very dark, funny approach to everything. It's this very sarcastic and it could almost be a bit much, but because of the brevity of the story and because of the way it's written, it's like just the right amount of that kind of sarcastic uh, crying at your own 
kind of experience otherwise you might just break down kind of thing and I really enjoyed that I think the fact that the narrator is like very self-aware of herself and her situation and the ways in which she could choose to respond to certain things in life um, but she takes kind of the other route which is to look at it with humor but also that slight kind of like downer side to it is is really good and I really enjoyed it um, yeah I would definitely recommend this book if you're looking for that kind of DWM character but maybe in just like a really small dose maybe if you don't feel like you're up to a full novel then this would be like a really good balanced type of story with a DWM also a New Zealand writer. Uh, next I read Happening by Annie Erno. This is her memoir of the time in the 1960s I think in France when she falls pe pregnant and uh, is trying to get an abortion. It's really about how that whole experience was quite lonely and isolating for Erno. Um, I think the thing that I was so affected by with this memoir was uh, Uno's ability to write about it in this very kind of detached way and yet still infuse it with humanity and emotion and describe the experience in such heavy detail. It often felt as though she was writing about somebody else. And then there would be small moments where she would tap into something and you would realize, oh wait, this is, this is, this happened to her. And yet she is able to kind of write with such sophistication and with such honesty and vulnerability and make it this really like harrowing story, but one that feels necessary to tell, I think especially in today's kind of climate with what's happening in America reading something like this and the realities of what it is like um, right from the actual act itself to the everyday the the logistics of it all all the things that she had to do in order for it to happen it's a depiction of those kinds of things that you don't really see in movies or TV yeah that's that's really what blew me away about this memoir and it being so tiny yet very very impactful and powerful and important. Uh, next up I read Little Labours by Rivka Gulshan. This is a collection of essays on babies and writing uh, and how those two things are connected. I think the title Little Labours kind of represents the two things very well this idea of writing being this task of tiny labors and a baby and its kind of experiences and being a mother and that that type of work obviously those connections can be made i think the problem that i have with this collection of essays is the tone of the writing and the way that it felt very one note throughout. I I felt as though there was no real no real change in that throughout the book and I didn't love the voice. There are really like hyper particular ways that Rivka Gulshan is writing in this collection that I think is supposed to come across as quite humorous but I just find very like irritating. Um, I found the last essay to be the most frustrating was it the last essay it was the essay about the passport and just like completely unaware of the kind of privilege that the, the writer has in that and what happened overall i don't think i connected with a lot of these essays because of the tone i was put off by that voice in the writing and that was frustrating Okay, next I read A Small Place by Jamaica Kincaid. I absolutely loved this memoir. 
It's a memoir, but it's also like a history lesson into the island of Antigua where Jamaica is from. A place that I didn't know much about, but yeah, she's delivered it in this perfect kind of way that makes it interesting and engaging and like very angry. It, yeah, it was so brilliant. I loved the voice of it. I loved the way that it was delivered and... I cannot wait to read more of Jamaica's writing. It opens with uh, Jamaica asking the reader to picture that they've just landed on the island of Antigua and um, from there she kind of takes you on this journey as if you are holidaying and she is forcing you to take a closer look at the realities of this beautiful island um, and the kind of corrupt and uh, dark kind of sides to it and what it is actually built on. It's this very interesting comparison of colonialism and slavery and, and modern day tourism and how those things are uh, the same and interconnected. She is absolutely unapologetic about the disdain that she has for the people that have this corrupt hold on this place and the way that kind of modern tourism feeds into that as well. Ugh, I just really really loved this book and thought that it was brilliant in every way and yeah you everyone needs to read it. It was so so good. One of my favorites of the year for sure. Okay, next up I read Troubling Love by Alana Ferrante. Um, this is one of her standalone fiction pieces that kind of almost grouped together as a trilogy, but not quite. Uh, there is this, which was her first published uh, fiction, The Days of Abandonment and The Lost Order. This one follows the character of Dahlia, who is has just lost her mother unexpectedly. Um, she is in the aftermath of her mother's death after the funeral trying to figure out what has led to her mother's death and what might have happened to her in the days before that. Uh, she is trying to recall a lot of her own childhood and memory and things that had happened when she was younger. Um, there is a lot a lot being said about uh, memory and whether or not it can be trusted especially as a child is what you're remembering uh, accurate she's discovering a lot of what she maybe didn't realize when she was younger just due to being young and not not understanding like the inner struggles that I guess at the adults around her were going through um, it's this very dreamlike, quite lucid story, and I find I found that really hard to distinguish what was true and what wasn't. I guess that could have been purposeful, but I think because there was so much of it throughout the novel, by the end of it, I really wasn't sure about anything that I had just read, and yeah, definitely did not trust her as a narrator. Did not trust the story as a whole really. Yeah, while it's not my favourite of hers, you definitely see how it's kind of been the beginning of her exploring those ideas and these types of female characters and yeah, it was another one to tick off the list and I'm almost done with all Ferrante's writing. So that feels good. Yeah, I read Sempre Susan by Secret Nunes, a memoir of Susan Sontag. Um, this was a very small memoir but packed with a lot of information and something that I took my time with because I didn't feel as though I needed to rush through it. Susan Sontag is a writer, a, a filmmaker, a photographer and this I think character that a lot of people have this idea about who she might be uh, which is often this quite standoffish brutal um, person who 
maybe a lot of people found quite difficult, which I think in some ways she was, but Sigra Nunez's portrait of her offers this very vulnerable kind of soft side to Susan that many people probably didn't know about. Sigrid was Susan's uh, assistant for a time at the New Yorker. Also dated Susan's son David for some years and so they li also lived together for a period and that kind of type of relationship allowed for Sigrid to write a memoir that both focused on a lot of Susan's work and ideas and also her behaviours and her personal kind of views and those things that make her human and make her lovable and I felt like that was a really interesting way to be able to remember someone and write about them. All memoirs should be written by people that know you and that very intimate kind of dynamic way and they have to be really good writers as well. But I really enjoyed this. I thought it was a really, really good memoir and now I want to watch some of Susan's films. Next I read Asylum Road by Olivia Sujic, which I don't have with me. I sent my copy off to Ben because uh, he said he really wanted to read it. So I said you can have mine because I did not love. I would say I just felt kind of nothing towards this book. I know it's very beloved by a lot of people on the internet. It follows a young couple who are traveling throughout Europe and they there's definitely some strain in the relationship that feels quite uh, dangerous, quite um, explosive. Like there's from the very first page you get the sense that things are not going to end well. Which carries throughout the entire book. There is definitely this boiling over tension between these two characters. The story is narrated from the perspective of Anya and I can't remember the boyfriend, the fiance's name, uh, but yeah a lot of it is Anya's own inner thoughts that she isn't voicing. Um, Anya is uh, an asylum seeker from Bosnia. She managed to escape the war that was happening there when she was a child and uh, left much of her family behind. And so there is this uh, difficulty that she has with those relationships and any kind of close relationship that she has had to try to foster. So yeah, she's dealing with the trauma of that and then also in this relationship that is not as fulfilling as I think she needs for it to be. Um, I think I've really enjoyed a lot of that kind of thinking and thought around kind of the ways trauma affects people and uh, I guess the the unseen bits of it um, but I was I was expecting I don't know maybe my expectations of this book were just not met because I didn't really know what it was going to be about and I didn't yeah it would kind of burn as slowly as it did loved the ending in fact wish that she could have gone off a bit sooner yeah I just kind of don't don't really have anything else to say about it I read it and that was a really lame review. Um, okay, the last book that I read in October was Giovanni's Room. So did I say October? Yeah, October. Um, by James Baldwin. This is my first ever reread, guys. I did a reread and it felt really good. I read this for Katie James's book club. Yeah, I loved being able to reread it a second time. I felt as though I was able to get so much more out of it. The first time I was definitely reading it more for the plot and what was going to happen and the second time I got a better understanding of the struggles and the torture that these characters uh, were going through and it was 
beautiful and sad and very moving. If you don't know what Giovanni's Room is about, it's about a young man named David who's American. He's traveled to France in order to kind of discover himself. Uh, there he meets a woman, they become engaged, she is unsure, she travels to Spain and while she is away David meets this young beautiful Italian man named Giovanni and there is this uh, other part of him that is awakened, this part that he has kind of been repressing for much of his life, kind of the true person he is, uh, this immense queer longing that he has uh, and while his fiance is away they have this very intense love affair that takes part mostly in Giovanni's kind of small very run down room that he lives in. The second time around I got so much more of the story, this idea of the room being this free space for Giovanni to kind of for not Giovanni, David to be himself, to give in to this side that he has wanted to for all these years but also it acts as this prison of him uh, not being able to be that person because he has these expectations put on him. He is this all-American man who his father expects great things from and uh, Staying in that room with Giovanni would mean disappointing the people who want that from him, want that other life for him. I just thought it was very beautiful and sad and I will definitely be rereading more books I think. That was the last book I read in October. I've got three books to go. November I read Incidental Inventions by Elena Ferrante. This is a collection of her articles that she wrote for The Guardian over the a year in 2000 and 2018. Yeah, she was approached by The Guardian to write these articles and she decided that she wanted to do it her way. They consist of much of her own kind of personal thoughts and feelings towards certain things. Um, each one has a little kind of theme or idea that she has perhaps been pondering. Um, yeah, it's this really kind of nice, thoughtful collection that covers a range of topics. Some like death and other things like the exclamation point and what she thinks about it. and. I can imagine that reading these week to week if you were a, a regular reader of The Guardian would have been a really nice kind of way to have something to just ponder on for the week. I almost feel as though a good project for this book would have been to have read it for the year and to read a story each week and be able to kind of sit with things a bit more. I mean I could still do that. I can, I can go back to it. It's also a very insightful look into who she is. I feel as though the more of her I've read, the better picture I kind of build of her. And I find that really interesting, the way that a person's body of work can paint this picture, um, especially when they're an anonymous person. She's not an anonymous person, but she chooses to remain anonymous. You know what I mean. Uh, next I read Howard's End by E.M. Forster. Um, I read this because I wanted to read On Beauty and uh, I was told by Karen that I had to read this first if I wanted to read On Beauty. So I did. I did it reluctantly. I did not enjoy this book. I found, I found it just very boring. I found the characters quite flat. I don't know whether it's just because it's a like a Victorian story but yeah, I think that's probably what kind of stopped me a lot. Uh, it follows two families, the Schlegels, which is a group of siblings and like some distant relatives, like an aunt and a cousin. Um, they are very 
kind of liberal in a lot of their social and political views. They appreciate the arts and what it offers and the insight that it gives and the idea that everyone should be able to access those things in society. And then we have the Wilcoxes who are in some ways a lot of the, the polar opposite. They're this very wealthy family who have very conservative views. They uh, are kind of obsessed with just gaining fortune and things and yeah, I don't agree with a lot of the Schlegel's ideas on, on things. Um, these families become interconnected when uh, one of the Schlegel sisters becomes briefly engaged to one of the Wilcox sons. That ends very quickly, like within the first few pages of the book, so that's not a spoiler. From there, it's kind of connected these two families and throughout we see their different encounters and the ways that they are kind of representative of like two different types, castes of society in England. There is also this uh, kind of secondary type character, Leonard Bast, who represents the poor kind of working class in England and he has this appreciation for art, this desire to want to be close to those things and so he becomes involved in, especially with the Schlegels. I kind of appreciate the overall messaging that is being explored but I don't, I didn't like the way that it was executed. I did appreciate the narrator, this kind of omniscient narrator and the way that they had this bigger understanding of what was going on, the cheeky little insights that they give into the characters and what they're thinking and societal parts that was quite humorous at times. Also there were some really beautiful descriptions of like the landscape and this appreciation for rural England. But other than that I just think overall I was just trying to get through it to get to the on beauty. I was like, I just want to read this other book. Yeah, didn't love, but was a necessary read in order to get to the book that I wanted to read. Okay, the last book that I read in oh, November was The Last Supper by Rachel Cuss. This is her memoir about three months that her and her family spend in Italy. And I loved it. If you cannot tell by how many pages I have folded over, but it's like nearly all the pages, like every page. Really, really loved this collection. I am obsessed with books set in Italy, Italian writers. Yeah, that, that whole setting and just the feeling of such a rich, long history. I really, really enjoy. I have a tiny bit of Italian heritage, so I feel as though it comes from that. So I love this book and I want to go to Italy. I want to do what... Rachel Cash did and just like drop everything go. Yeah I would say more than a memoir is probably uh, collections of essays. They vary in themes. There's essays about food, there's essays about specific places in uh, Italy that have connections to Scotland. Um, there is lots of talk about art and kind of religious themes. I think the interesting thing that I found throughout the reading of this was that the, what wasn't touched on, which was the question of, sorry it's raining and I've left my washing outside, this on and off summer rain really starting to irk me. Where was I? I was talking about this. The thing that I picked up on the most was what was not being addressed in the book, which was why they have taken this trip. Like, what are they running away from? It, it feels as though it's a lot more than... It's a summer vacation. You get the sense that uh, is really trying to search for something. And so what do people do when they have that sense of being lost? They run away. And so, yeah, I found that quite an interesting uh, omission throughout much of the, the collection or the memoir. But overall, I really enjoyed it. Some of my favourite essays... I like to mark them in the front. Month, uh, Italian in three months, The Pregnant Madonna, I Am Nothing, I Am Everything, Gianfranco's Store, Volcanoes and Thieves. But overall I've really enjoyed this whole collection. I think Cass's writing is just so precise and correct 
and boundary pushing in a lot of ways. I think similar to her fiction, she always pushes me to think about the ways in which things can be uh, described, can be uh, broken down and put back together and uh, presented in a new way. And so it's always this very refreshing experience to read her writing. This was no different. So I loved. So that's everything I read in October and November. <sighs> we did it. Thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate it. Let me know what you read in either of those months. What was your favourite book that you read? If you've read any of these, if you have any thoughts that you want to share, I would love to hear from you. I would also really appreciate it if you're watching this and you aren't already subscribed. If you would subscribe. I don't ask of that of people often, but I would really appreciate it a lot. Tell your friends too. That would be also great. Uh, thank you so much and I will see you next time. Ka kite.